What I want to go on to talk about now is how to critique a research paper. Now, the research we actually use, we get from research papers. Now, in publications, you normally find there's basically two types of journals. The first I will call a primary source journal. Now in a primary source journal, it is the initial source that the information originally came from, or it's the first time the information was published. So in a primary source journal, you'll have actual research papers written by the researchers themselves that relate the findings of their research. Primary source. And if you really want to understand the topic properly, to be able to critique it properly, you've got to go back to the primary source. Because if you're not using primary source material, then you're using secondary source material. Now, secondary source material is other people who've taken primary source material and rearranged it into maybe a, a review article or a, a teaching article but you haven't actually got the original research that was done. And indeed, sometimes people take these articles and transpose those again. So it's actually a third or a fourth source. So when critiquing, it's important to get at least some primary source material. Now, I want to run through a few things that we need to think about when we are actually critiquing research. And the first one is quite simple. Oh, by the way, remember, critiquing means pointing out the good points as well as the bad points. It means being critical about the paper. But the first thing I want to talk about is just the title of the paper. Does the title accurately represent the content of the paper? In other words, is the title a valid representation of what the paper actually reports on? So if, so if the title says something like, New Cure for Cancer, and it turns out that the paper is just a review of some patients with a particular type of cancer, then that's not a valid title because it's not accurately representing the content of the paper. So the title should accurately and succinctly represent the content that's actually being discussed in the paper. Next thing I want to talk about is the abstract. Now an abstract is a review of the content of the paper. It's just normally a, a few hundred words at the start that describes what is actually in the paper. And it might, it might give an introduction, it might give something like a research methodology, some results, and maybe just a sentence or so for discussion. And when you're flicking through a journal, what you often do is you read the abstracts to decide if you want to go on and, and read all of the paper or not. So it's just a quick review of it. But again, it should be an accurate, valid review of what is in the paper and it should give you enough information to decide if you want to go on and read the whole paper or not. Now you might have realised that what I'm doing in this section of the tape is basically giving you a series of questions to answer about the particular paper you're studying. And what this means is that if you've got an essay to write on this, then if you go through and answer all these questions, then or, or answer some of the questions anyway, that might give you a, a basis for your essay. The next thing I want to talk about is the literature review. Now, Literature reviews should be critical and up-to-date. The researcher should not just list a load of pieces of research, they should actually say something about it and hopefully allow these pieces of research to interact with one another, pointing out areas of agreement and disagreement in the literature over the topic under consideration. Another function of the literature review is to rapidly bring the reader up-to-date so it should give a concise background to the subject under consideration. Does it do that? A good literature review will bring you rapidly up to date in the field that's being considered.
Do you get the impression that the researcher is familiar with the material? Do you get the impression this researcher knows what he or she is talking about? Or are they just trying to get a publication done? The literature re review might help you again to make a decision on that. Now, the literature review should justify the need for the subject. By giving the background, it should justify the need for why this subject has been chosen by the researcher to research. So does the literature review give a kind of rationale for why this piece of research is being carried out? The literature review should link the current study with previous studies. So pre new, new studies don't just spontaneously appear normally. Uh, some very brilliant pieces of, of uh, research might, but normally it's a continuous process. And one particular study will be based on various other particular studies. Do you get the impression that this current study is part of a continuity of an ongoing research process? Because normally that will be the case. Maybe the most famous physicist of all, Isaac Newton, said that he only saw as far as he did because he was standing on the shoulders of giants. So, is the current research linked in with previous research findings, as illustrated in the literature review? Is the study a logical progression in the research process? Now, the literature review should also bring you fairly rapidly up to date with any conceptual or theoretical requirements that are necessary to understand the paper. So, is relevant theory alluded to in the literature review. If it's necessary to understand the paper, then it should be. Now, this is an interesting one. Is the literature review honest? Is it comprehensive? Does it cover all of the literature? Or is the researcher only taking little bits of the literature to try and make a particular point? Because a literature review should be in sufficient depth and breadth. And in a literature review, in most research publications, it's breadth that counts, because there's not a lot of words. So is the researcher only bringing to light pieces of research that make a particular point, and missing out other things that contradict his particular point? Because sometimes not telling the whole truth is really the same as lying. So is the literature represented? Is the totality of the literature represented in the literature review? And the last point I want to make about literature reviews are, are the referencing. Are the references correct? Are they uh, an accurate representation of what has been reported on in the literature review and in other parts of the paper? Are the references drawing on appropriate primary source material? Because they should be drawing on primary source material and not just using secondary source material. 
Now it's important to look at the overall ethical perspective of the study. Was this an ethical piece of research? Was it a piece of research you would have been happy to be involved in yourself? So what's your overall impression of the researcher's attitude towards ethical issues is always a legitimate question. We should not use research which has been gained using non-ethical means of research or experimentation as a general principle. Were any patients or staff involved given freedom of choice as to whether they entered the study or not? Was there any coercion? Because there shouldn't be. There should be free choice as to whether someone takes part in the study or not. If control groups and experimentation was involved, were the control groups given the best of possible conventional treatment? Because they should have been. They should have been given the best conventional treatment that was available, while the experimental group got the extra new intervention in addition to that. So it's worth writing a paragraph in your critique about the ethical considerations in the study. Now just before we go on to look at the uh, sections of a research paper, I just want to throw in a few general points that don't quite fit in anywhere else. Does the paper provide a complete overview of the study, is a good question. Do you get the impression that you're being told everything you need to know about the study? Is the paper using any jargon, any unnecessary technical terms? And do you understand the technical terms which are there? If not, it might be necessary to look them up. But if the paper is using too many unnecessary technical terms, then that is a legitimate criticism of the paper for doing that. And do you feel there's any important omissions that the researcher has left out from the report? Because if you feel there's important omissions, things that have been left out, then you can't make an overall judgment on the piece of work which is being reported on. The next thing to look at is the research problem that's actually being investigated by the study. Is the research problem or the question to be investigated clearly identified? Is it clear what the research process is actually studying? The actual research problem? Because if the problem is not clearly identified and the research is done, then some other thing could be found that's not actually the problem. And the whole point is that the research process should be examining a particular problem. Is the problem expressed in terms of a hypothesis? Do you remember a hypothesis is a statement that can be tested? Now the research problem does not have to be expressed as a hypothesis, but very often it's useful if it is. Now is the study addressing one research problem or more than one research problem. Because normally it's best if a study only addresses one research problem. Now very cleverly designed studies can address several problems at once, but it is much easier to just address one single problem, or certainly one main problem, with one piece of research. 
The next thing I want to consider is the sample that was used. Now, the sample should represent the population under study. The population means the entire people that uh, are represented by, by whatever is being studied. So, for example, um, if you wanted to study leg ulcers, then the population is everyone with a leg ulcer. If you are studying multiple sclerosis, the population is everyone in the world with multiple sclerosis. But obviously you can't study every single individual in the world with multiple sclerosis. What you must do is take a sample of that larger population group. So a sample should represent the population under study. So is the population under study clearly identified? It should be because otherwise we're not going to know who the sample is supposedly representing. How was the sample recruited into the study? Well, what form of sample was used? Now, in clinical trial research, um, it's very important to use a randomised sample. The sample should be randomly selected, randomly recruited. But very often, in a lot of research, researchers simply use a convenience sample. This just means they recruit into the study the first 50 people that they can get hold of. It's just a sample of convenience. And there's no effort to get a randomised sample. And of course, normally, a randomised sample would represent the population under study in a more valid way than a convenience sample. So is the sample a valid representation of the population under study? What measures were taken to collect a random sample, if indeed random sampling has been used? Were random number tables used, for example? was some sort of random computerised selection used to ensure that the sample is a genuinely random sample from the population under, under, under study. Now what about the size of the sample used? Do you think it's big enough to be a valid representation of the whole population? Because generally speaking, the larger the sample, the better. Now I know that inferential statistics will take into account the sample size, but generally speaking, the larger the sample, the better, especially if the effect that you are studying is a fairly subtle effect. Now what about the response rate? Is the response rate mentioned? Because people, a researcher might invite a, a thousand people into the study, and only a hundred or two of those will respond. Now, can you see this as a possible source of bias? Because the people that respond might be interested for a particular reason. So, generally speaking, the higher the response rate, the better. What is the response rate to the researcher's questionnaire, or whatever it was the researcher did to uh, try and recruit his sample or her sample? One reason this is very important is the next question. Does the sample allow the results to be generalised? Because a lot of the point of doing research is so that we can say, well, yes, this finding was true in this particular sample. Therefore, this finding will be true in the general. It will be true for all of the population. So if the sample is small or non-representative, that will not allow the findings to be generalised. If the research is of a very qualitative nature, it might give you some interesting insights, but normally it will not allow for a generalisation of the findings. So with a good sample, what is true for the sample will be true for the total population, therefore the results will be generalisable. And a good researcher should make comment onto how generalisable his findings indeed are, based largely on the nature of the sample recruited.
The next question is fairly simple and straightforward. Was a pilot study used? Now a pilot study is an initial small scale study that's used to refine and develop the methodology. So if a pilot study was used, the methodology is likely to be better than if a pilot study was not used. The next point I want to discuss is the research method that was used. Now the research method and the research design will vary depending on the objectives of the study. For example, we talked about experimental case control work where you want to demonstrate the effectiveness or otherwise of an intervention to demonstrate causality, that one thing causes another. Analytical surveys will look at things naturally occurring, maybe like a type of audit study where you've got people coming in with wounds that are being treated in a particular way and you analyse the treatments that are being carried out. You don't actually intervene and change anything. So it could be an analytical survey without a manipulation. These can also demonstrate causality. It could potentially show that one wound dressing is, resulting, is giving better results in wound healing than another wound dressing. It could be a cohort longitudinal study designed to follow people up over a long period of time. What is the effect of diet over a long period of time? Is tamoxifen effective in reducing breast cancer over a long period of time? Depends on the objectives that you're looking for. There could be a type of case control study. These are good for retrospective comparisons. So for example, if a group of employees is found to develop cancer, then we certainly want to know why that is. So we could recruit those into the case group retrospectively and then we could recruit controls without cancer who in other, way, in, other many, in, in other respects were the same as the case group but didn't have cancer. Then we can try and find out um, to, to try and find a phenomena which could explain the difference in the outcomes. So in other words, you take the case group with the cancer, you take the control group without the cancer, and you try and find out what is the difference between the two groups. And if you find out what the difference is, you may well have found out what has caused the cancer. We could go on about different types of research being appropriate for different types of questions. So the first question, does the design match the ob objective? Does the design match the objective? There's no absolute rules for deciding on this. Very often you've just got to use your initiative and come to some kind of judgment as to whether the design is appropriate for the objective of the study. Identify the prime research methodology used. What is the main research methodology used? And were any other research methodologies used as well? Were these methods an appropriate way to collect the data? How was the evidence collected? It should be possible to identify the stages in the method. Because ideally, if the method is well written up, you should be able to duplicate it from that. This is very important. If someone has a particular finding, other researchers should be able to duplicate that same finding. It should be reliable. So is there enough evidence in the methods for you, if you so choose and have the resources, to duplicate the study. What tools were used to collect the data? Were the questionnaires, were the surveys, how was the information collected? What tools were used? Are the variables studied clearly identified? So if one variable was that some employees got cancer, another variable was that they were exposed to radiation or a particular chemical, are these variables clearly identified? And ideally, the variables should be measurable. Are the variables measurable? Can they be quantified? 
The next thing I'll call collection. How was the data collected? For example, was experimentation involved in collecting data? If so, was the study blind, double blind or not blind at all? How was the data collected? What was the nature of the data collected? Was the data quantitative, involving numbers, or was it qualitative, involving opinions and the way people were feeling? Was it quantitative or qualitative data? How was the data collected? Interviews, questionnaires, observation, experimentation, how was the data actually collected? Can you detect any sources of bias that might have been introduced in the way that the data was collected? Systematic bias or non-systematic intermittent bias in the way that the data was collected? Were the data collected in wards, colleges, home? Where was the data collected? is an interesting question. Was participant confidentiality respected? You shouldn't really be able to tell the individuals that the data came from, especially if it's information of a fairly personal or, or medical nature. Was the data collected on one occasion or on several occasions? If it was collected on several occasions, it's possible the circumstances could have changed and that could change the nature of the data that was actually collected. So is the data collected a rap, uh, an accurate representation of the variables that are actually under study? Is the data collected a valid representation of the variables that are being studied? If it's not, it isn't any good because it's not representing the variables, it's representing something else. How many approaches did the study take in the collection of the data? Because sometimes a study will collect data in one way and it will look at the same data but using another methodology. This is actually very good because it means if you collect data using one type of method and you collect data using another type of method and the data is the same both times, then it's likely that the methods of collecting the data were valid. This is sometimes called triangulation. You can use two or three methods to collect the same data. If those methods of collecting the data yield different data, then that data has got to be questionable because one method yields one set of data studying one phenomena and studying the same phenomena, a different method yields alternative data. They both can't be right. But if different methodologies yield the same data, then that is using triangulation and it's more likely that the data are actually representing the reality that the data are supposed to represent. Now the next question is what were the actual results themselves? What was the main result found by the study? Identify the principal result, what was it? And then were there any other secondary results associated with the study as well? What about the descriptive 
the, 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 the descriptive way the results were presented, the descriptive statistics used. Are the descriptive statistics presented clearly? Or are they open to misunderstanding? Or are they even designed to mislead, as we looked at in some earlier examples? So are the descriptive statistics easy to follow and a valid representation of the data? Are the results presented significant? If the p-values are less than, uh, if the p-values, sorry, are greater than 0.05, then the result is not significant because remember we said that significant data has p-values that have a value of 0.05 or less. So are the results significant? Are claims made or inferred as to the legitimacy of generalising the results? Because remember, we need to be able to generalise the results. And are these claims of generalise ability, the, the degree to which we can generalise the results, legitimate or not? So is there comment made as to how generalisable the results are, so we can generalise it into our own uh, situation. We're now going to think about the analysis of the data that has been generated by the study. First of all, were any aids used in the analysis procedure, like computer programs, for example? Maybe a statistical package was used. Is it an appropriate application to use for the analysis of the data under consideration? What statistical tests were employed? Now, it's a little difficult without knowing about the statistics, but you know, you can note at least what statistical tests were employed and ideally comment on how appropriate it was to use that particular statistical test to test the particular set of data that was generated. What about the ana analysis methodology? Was it a logical choice to manipulate the data that was collected? Did the analysis follow a logical procedure in the way it dealt with the data? Was it a consistent way of dealing? with the data. What about the link between the results and the analysis? Is that logical? So a research process should be, should be a, a unified whole really, each bit should be linked to the other bits. So the results and the analysis should be linked, the analysis should be a logical way to follow on from the results and should follow on logically. And a very advanced critique might be if you could suggest an alternative way of interpreting the data that was presented. So if the research, researcher analysed the data in a particular way, and you could suggest alternative ways of carrying out the analysis, then that would be quite an advanced aspect of critique. Let's now think about the discussion section of the report. This should identify whether the study has been done before. Is this a replication study? It's quite legitimate to do replication studies because if one study shows the same results as another study, then those results are likely to be correct. So is it identified if it's a replication study or is it studying something completely new? Are areas of agreement and disagreement between different papers discussed? This should really be brought in at the discussion stage. So the researcher could say, well, this paper agrees with Smith, who found this particular result, and it disagrees with Jones, who found something slightly different. 
areas of agreement and disagreement from the current results and previous results, previous research reports, can be discussed. And reasons for this can be discussed at this stage. Are the meaning of the results discussed in a logical progression from results to analysis to discussion? In other words, the data is the results and this should be analysed to make sense of the raw results, the raw data. Then the discussion should be based on those two things really, as well as the methodology. So is the discussion um, putting into context the analysis and the results? Does the discussion critique the methodology used? This is very important. Does the discussion critique the methodology? Does it point out areas where the methodology was good? This is the way that the data was generated, of course. Does it point out areas where the methodology could be improved if the study were to be carried out again? 